Aerial combat, like naval warfare, has many risks attached to it, many of which arise from the fact that the human beings involved in such engagements are far removed from their natural element, the land. Whether a few hundred or perhaps a thousand miles out to sea, or a few thousand feet up in the air. When you're fighting so far out of your natural element, you risk death not only from your enemy's weaponry, but also from the inherent danger of falling from the skies or into the unforgiven water. During the course of the Second World War, the men of RAF Bomber Command faced a high threat of death. Indeed, over 55,000 RAF Bomber Command servicemen would perish during the course of the war, a death toll second only to the U-boat arm of the German Kriegsmarine. Nicholas Alchemide was one individual of RAF Bomber Command who stared certain death in the face, but extraordinarily managed to survive. Alchemide was born on the 10th of December 1922 in Norfolk and was a market gardener in Loughborough before the outbreak of war. Following training as an air gunner, he was posted to 115 Squadron as a rear gunner on board a Navarro Lancaster. After successfully completing 14 operations, Alchemide's crew were dealed to raid Berlin on the night of the 24th and 25th of March 1944. Alchemy's Lancaster, a Mark II, coded A4K, and with the registration number DS664, was one of 300 aircraft destined to attack the German capital. Christened Werewolf by its crew, the Lancaster took off from RF Wichfeld in Cambridgeshire at 1848 hours and set a course for Berlin. That would journey to Berlin went according to plan, but the return journey was a different story. An unusually strong north wind blew many of the returning aircraft far to the south of their intended track, and Werewolf was pushed towards the Ruhr Valley with its heavy concentration of anti-aircraft defences. Shortly before midnight, a Junkers Ju-88 night fighter, flown by Oberleutnant Heinz Roker of Nachter Geschwar des Zwei, intercepted Werewolf east of Schmalenberg and attacked the Lancaster from beneath with cannon and machine guns. The starboard wing and fuselage of the Lancaster were shredded and erupted into flames which streamed back beyond Alchemy's rear turret. The detonation and explosions caused by the bullets blew out all of the perspex of the rear turret, further exposing Alchemy to the frigid night air. The engagement was not, however, totally one-sided, with Alchemy managing to get off a burst of fire at the Junkers 88 with his four machine guns, though reports of damage to the aircraft proved to be wide of the mark. The brief engagement had mortally wounded the Lancaster, and before long, Flight Sergeant James Newham, the pilot, ordered the crew to take to their parachutes. The rear turret of a Lancaster was too cramped for the gunner to wear a parachute. Instead, it was stored in a canister in the rear fuselage to be clipped onto a chest harness when required. Centering his turret and opening the doors, Alchemide was greeted by a vision of hell. His parachute was already well alight, and the fierce flames seared his exposed face and wrists. His rubber oxygen mask, clamped tight over his mouth and nose, began to melt. The immense heat forced Alchemy to close the turret doors again. With the doors closed, he realised that he was trapped, falling through the sky in a burning and abandoned aircraft, three and a half miles above enemy territory. Things, however, were about to get worse. The fire, which was devouring the aircraft, now breached the rear doors and set the turret's hydraulic fluid alight. The liquid fuel flames spread to Alchemy's clothing. He later recalled that at this point, I had the choice of staying with the aircraft or jumping out. If I stayed, I would be burned to death. My clothes were already well alight and my face and hands burnt, though at the time I scarcely noticed the pain owing to my high state of excitement. I decided to jump and end it all as quickly and clean as I could. I rotated the turret to starboard, and not even bothering to take off my helmet and intercom, did the back flip out into the night. It was very quiet, the only sound being the drumming of aircraft engines in the distance, and no sensation of falling at all. I felt suspended in space. Regrets at not getting home were my chief thoughts, and I did think once that it didn't seem very strange to be going to die in a few seconds. None of the parade of my past or anything else like that. Preferring to die on impact with the ground rather than to be burnt alive, Alchemide had decided to jump from the aircraft, which at the time was at an altitude of 18,000 feet. Falling headfirst and occasionally looking and seeing the stars twinkling in the night sky, Alchemide hurled towards the ground at 120 miles per hour. 
At some point during the descent, Alchemy lost consciousness, possibly as his body's reaction to the pain, where the flames had licked around his skin, along with oxygen deprivation. Above him, the Lancaster exploded. Three hours later, Alchemy opened his eyes. He was surprised to find himself lying on snowy ground in a small pine wood. Above him, the stars were still visible, only this time they were framed by the edges of the hole that he had smashed through the tree canopy. Assessing himself, Alchemy found that he was remarkably intact. In addition to the burns and cuts to his head and thigh, which he had received in the aircraft, he was suffering only bruising and a twisted knee. Not a single bone had been broken or even fractured. Both of his flying boots had disappeared, probably torn from his feet as he unconsciously struck the tree branches. Being of no further use, Alchemy discarded his parachute harness in the snow. Lighting a cigarette from the pack he kept in his Irvin suit, Alchemy surveyed his landing zone. The snow was approximately 18 inches deep and had been sheltered from the sun by the pine trees. Approximately 20 yards away was open ground completely devoid of snow. If he had come down there, nothing would have saved him. As it was, the flexible branches of the young pines had slowed Alchemy's descent just enough for the mattress of snow to cushion him as he reached the ground. Unable to walk and freezing cold, Alchemy blew his distress whistle to attract attention. A band of German civilians, possibly home guardsmen, arrived shortly thereafter and carried him to a local infirmary which sent him to the better facilities at a local hospital. There, his burns were tended and a quantity of perspex and wooden splinters were removed from his body. The next day, Alchemy was released into Gestapo custody, whereupon he was interrogated, the Gestapo demanding to know what had happened to his parachute. When he told them that he hadn't used one, the interrogators laughed at him and accused him of being a spy and of burying it. Indignantly, Alchemy challenged the Gestapo to find his discarded harness, informing them that the lift webs, which would unclip and extend the parachute when deployed, would still be in the stored position. A search of the woods was conducted and soon bore out Alchemy's story. Further corroboration came from the wreckage of Werewolf, which had crashed 20 miles away from where Alchemy had landed. The metal record handle and the cable of his parachute were still stored in their container. Released from Gestapo custody, Alchemy was sent to a prisoner of war camp. His experience made him a minor celebrity amongst the prisoner of war fraternity. In total, he spent three weeks in the hospital before he was sent to Dolagluft Prisoner of War Transit Centre. At Dolagluft, the prisoners were paraded and regaled with the incredible tales of Alchemy's survival by a Luftwaffe officer. Alchemy was even provided with a commemorative certificate, which stated, It has been investigated and corroborated by the German authorities that the claim of Sergeant Alchemy, number 143-1537, is true in all respects, namely that he has made a descent from 18,000 feet without a parachute and made a safe landing without injuries, the parachute having been on fire in the aircraft. He landed in deep snow among fir trees. Alchemy was photographed for the German press before being sent to Stalaglov III, near Zagen, Poland. Here, his story earned him extra cigarettes in return for inscribing prisoners' wartime logs. As the war turned against Germany in late 1944, Alchemy was amongst the inmates of Style Club 3, who would all later be among the tens of thousands of Allied prisoners of war forced to march westward, some pulling possessions on hastily crafted sledges through blizzard conditions on little to no food so that the Germans could prevent their liberation by the advancing Russians. The long march, as these evacuations are now collectively known, would claim the lives of hundreds of men unable to survive the cold, exhaustion, hunger and tragic incidents of friendly fire by roving Allied aircraft. Somehow, Alchemy made it through to be liberated, the snow still watching over him. It is worth briefly posing to look at what happened to the other men who composed Werewolf's crew. Alchemy was just one of seven aboard the Lancaster when Rook struck. As things transpired, he would be one of only three survivors. Sergeant John Cleary, the navigator, and Sergeant Geoffrey Burwell, the wireless operator, both also became prisoners of war after being forcibly ejected from Werewolf by the explosion. Cleary's damaged parachute self-deployed during his descent into the same woods as Alchemy, and he was knocked unconscious in a collision with a tree trunk. Exposed to the crippling cold, Cleary nearly lost a leg to frostbite as well as enduring a collapsed lung. He would spend the next six months in local hospital before being repatriated as part of an exchange of sick and wounded prisoners in February 1945. Tragically, however, the other four crew members of Werewolf, Flight Sergeant James Newham, the pilot, Sergeant Edgar William Warren, the flight engineer, Sergeant Charles Hilda, the bomb aimer, and Sergeant John McDo, the mid-upper gunner, were all killed. 
They now lie next to each other in Hanover War Cemetery. Following being discharged from the RAF in 1946, Alchemid returned to Loughborough finding work in a chemical plant. Not long after starting his new job, he again cheated death. While removing chlorine gas generated liquid from a sump, he received a severe electric shock from the equipment that he was using. Reeling away, his gas mask became dislodged and he began breathing in the poisonous chlorine gas. An agonising 15 minutes were to pass before his appeals for aid were answered and he was dragged to safety, nearly asphyxiated by the fumes. Not long thereafter, a siphoning pipe burst, spring Alchemy's face and arms with industrial sulfuric acid. With astounding presence of mind, he dived headfirst into a nearby 40 gallon drum of lime wash, thereby neutralising the acid. Alchemy escaped with first degree burns. Returning to work, Alchemid was then pinned beneath a nine foot long steel door runner that fell from its mountings as he passed by. Somehow, he only suffered minor bruising as a result. After the third incident, even Alchemid thought that enough was enough and gave up his job to become a furniture salesman. He continued to live in Loughborough, where he lived with his wife and children, he passed away, much later than he might otherwise have done, in June 1987 at the age of 64. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe for more updates, like and share. You can also help to support the channel at Patreon. Details are in the description box below.